I also am really happy to be here, very grateful for the chance to talk about one of my favorite things, which is preserving land. So my topic is art and land conservation. And we're going to start with a quote that is at the entrance to the Smithsonian's Museum of American Art. So it acts as the context and focus for all of the art on the ground floor and the second floor, all of which is landscape painting. And uh, here's the quote. It's pretty amazing because what we find is, well, it's partly covered. What we find is um, there was pretty much a good sense of confidence that we were a garden. And to me, a garden, uh, obviously in 1901, we'd already sullied a lot of it, and this is part of what led John Muir, whose quote this is, to cooperate and teach Teddy Roosevelt quite a bit about what needed to be preserved and set aside in different kinds of gardens. But what we have found in the last 111 years since this quote is that um, our definition of what our land is is much more complex, involves a lot of other things than just being considered a garden or something even that is just about natural resources that we could exploit and use. So beyond from this early period having forests which are, were perceived as timber and trees and lumber or fields which were farms and food, we also now have a host of things, as all of you know, the concern about climate change, how resilient will we be, what happens with biodiversity, and so on. Artists and land conservation groups are responding to that new complexity. And what we're finding is that a lot of natural preservation groups started out saying, well, we've got to preserve for biodiversity. The trend now is to say, we know we just have to do preservation. We're not exactly sure that we're always going to be hitting the top most important aspect, but if people say they want to preserve it, we probably should preserve it. It means they'll come up with some money to do it. And likewise, artists are saying, I'm not exactly sure what it is that is most worrisome to me or most opportunistic to me and what I can do with this concept I have of land and the complexity of our fragile world, but I'd like to begin to approach it and work with it sometimes in the landscape as well. So I'm going to look at some of the um, net results of this recently. We now have 747 million or so acres preserved in this country. That's 20 percent of the land mass. Those have been for multi-purposes. Sometimes it's about protecting water, food, working landscapes of other sorts, playgrounds. Dog parks are the most rapidly growing type of park. It's risen by 34% in the last couple of years. People like their off-leash dog parks because they're having fewer children or they're empty nesters. Artists also have come at this from multiple perspectives as we've seen and I'd like to focus on two in the New York region so that you could actually go visit them if you wanted to or see something about their work. I've got these two brochures out on the hallway next to where James's art is uh, got little um, sign-up sheets if you would like to buy some of the art that's out there and these will tell you something they're sort of guides to what's going on in uh, some of the projects I'll talk about. So pick those up. The two artists are Deborah Friedman a painter born in 1947, and George Trakas, an environmental artist born in 1944. They both work in this region. You don't have to travel to Marfa, Texas, or to the Spiral Jetty to see something about this work. So we've got two ladies here. The one on the right is Deborah Friedman. This is actually taken just a couple of weeks ago out at the new site of the FDR Four Freedoms Memorial that's designed by Louis Kahn. It's only being realized now. As you know, Khan died in the 70s, but this is a major undertaking. They have raised most of the money. All of the masonry is now in place. It is a phenomenally beautiful site, and I would urge you to go. It actually doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about, but I happen to be there in the picture as of Deborah. So what she has done is, in her work, is taken the more traditional view and stuck with the media that's painting and printmaking. She does monotypes and she does uh, uh, oil painting mostly. But these are of a size and scale that fit on a wall and can go in a museum and are really uh, sort of an extension of the earlier 19th century concern with the sublime in the American landscape. Deborah basically started out with a good deal of up-close, 
in forest paintings, waterfalls, trees, there was almost no horizon line. But 9-11 actually deeply affected her and she began to paint what she called disturbed landscapes. And she took more seriously what it meant to have preserved land near where she lived out in the countryside. This is the Shokin Reservoir, which is part of the system that preserves water for New York City's drinking. So she began to get herself to these sites, spend a lot of time on them, and paint them over and over. This current series, and I'm just going to show you the two, are from a series she calls Goodnight Irene. And this is based on the Hurricane Irene, which of course was ironically named since it wasn't in any way ironic. And it further disturbed her because she felt now we had, not, we had gone beyond the concerns that she had about how to keep the water safe and clean, access to those reservoirs open because of concern about terrorists and the um, civil oversight that clamped down on access to the reservoirs after 9-11. But now we also were facing a great good deal of uncertainty about the impact of nature and what would happen when hurricanes ripped through and destroyed towns. Her interest was really to be able to say in this series, I'm concerned about my small towns. I'm not sure that we can really say good night, Irene, you know, as in put you to bed, Irene, and get rid of you. Uh, but her worry that the devastation might return is still causing a good deal of artistic interpretation that's abstract and that has a heightened sense of worry and concern. I think there's a good deal of that, um, certainly in Alexis's work, but in others where people are uh, saying, are you, are you awake? Are you paying attention? Is this going to make you move and do something? Now, this obviously is not in any way a roadmap. But I'm going to turn now to George Trakis, who's actually taken this art, as many artists have, outside of the museum. So he doesn't work in drawings or paintings. He jumps outside, and he gets to work in the landscape. It's um, what I like to think of as analogous to slow food. It's slow art. He goes out into the landscape, builds a little boat, putters around in the water, really gets to know the place, and then comes up with uh, some ideas about what he could do on the land. So I'm going to go through three of them chronologically. This is uh, Beacon Landing. This is very accessible. It's in New York, right near um, the Dia Beacon. And Dia Beacon was instrumental in getting this place started because Scenic Hudson, one of the great land trusts in the Hudson Valley, had purchased some land and was going to preserve it. And the Dia Beacon people said rather quietly to some of us involved in art, well, we're not sure that Scenic Hudson has ever really considered art when it's had a park. Or if they have, we've never seen evidence of it. So we were hoping that since this is really relational to our new museum, that you would help us find an artist who can handle the development of this site. The site itself is 22 acres. It was an abandoned uh, railway shunting yard. It was all landfill. And as with much of where George works, it's been abandoned, misused, abused. It's often quite polluted. And he came into the site, uh, again, did his stuff at the boat, began to meet people in the area, and got to work with permitting. And as he says, his process is actually really uh, loves to engage with people, including the Army Corps of Engineers. They don't frighten him at all. He was told that it would take him years to get the permits, but in fact, it took him about four months. So he works very closely. He gets out there. That, this is, that's his car, so he drives up and down. Sometimes he's on the train. It's a little um, hut, so he has a safe place to be when the weather is stormy on the Hudson. And you're seeing the back side of a sign that you saw on the front side on the other one, just a little bit of it there on the side. And it basically says, there are dangerous cables under this water. No one may anchor here. So you're not allowed to move that sign. It has to stay. So he integrates it into what he does. That's the inside of the hut, where he spends a good deal of time. Different people he's found in there sleeping when he shows up. But here we already have the, the integration of what he does. So he takes the environment as he finds it, works with it in order to anchor it into place uh, and give it some uh, reminiscent feeling of the original shoreline. Um, he accounts for, now we're seeing the laying of the planking on top of all that uh, infrastructure of steel. But he gives the water a space to move for high tide and low tide, you can get to this water in a wheelchair. 
not that you have to be in a wheelchair, um, but it is absolutely counterintuitive to what usually happens in a park by Scenic Hudson or anyone else, which along the Hudson has to conform to permitting and is usually built with a 13 foot high bulkhead wall in order to be ready for a 100 year storm event and to keep people safe. And like Mark was saying with the um, registrar at the um, London Museum, people are incredibly afraid of the water. They consider it very dangerous. So this was a really maverick thing for him to do, and he felt quite an accomplishment to be able to get access. And as soon as the place is built, it fills up with people. <laughs> they come out. Uh, in fact, it's beginning to surprise and sort of annoy uh, the caretakers because they're not quite sure. These are school classes. This group is here talking to the crabbers who are showing them how their crabbing works. Um, there are more people there than anyone thought would be there. Here's a, a little boy. If he were to turn to the right, he would see this. Um, George makes it very possible to get to the water, to sit down, to stroll, to lounge. And they really are getting many more people than they ever thought they would have. Another site that he's worked in is in New York City. The land here is obviously uh, much more valuable, but in fact, this is in an area where um, no one wanted this land. It's on uh, Newtown Creek, and that's what it's known as, the Newtown Creek Water Treatment Facility. The Newtown Creek Park itself is about two acres of built space, but it sits around like an outer edge that people can get to around a water treatment plant that handles 600 million gallons of water a day. It's one of New York City's 14 water treatment plants. You probably know the one that you pass when you're on the West Side Highway that they built off of Harlem and that involved a lot of community attention and activity. This one also involved some community activity. This is a very blighted part of northern Brooklyn. And the community, per se, said during the original meetings that George went to, what do you mean you're going to make a park and we're not going to be part of it? How are we going to get to it? There's no access. What do you mean it's only for the people who work in the water treatment plant? No, no, no. We have to have access. So George came up with a way to get into it. This is his ideal of how it will be used over time. Again, you see the steps going down to the water so you can get in and out of your vessel. But the way you get to it is by going to a dead end, parking your car. There are about 20 parking spots because there's no mass transit there. Uh, and you go in through a series of gates that are very reminiscent of highly stylized waves. And there are light features that are about uh, nautical elements. You go up and over the plant itself. It's about 740 feet of walking. As you get to one end, you turn around and you see the Empire State Building, so you're really located in New York City. You should know where you are when you see this. Uh, you turn back, heading north, and you come down toward the water. And again, you've got these wonderful spaces on both sides of the steps. Those are little handrails. He was very responsive to people in the community. They said they, they knew he loved water, so what was he going to do to show, other than getting them access to the water? These handrails are H2O molecules. You see them. And again, he's got these long steps, which remind me, he says they don't have anything to do with it, but they remind me of the Ghats in India, where you go to the sacred river in order to really commune with the water and where the water will take away all of your sins. So he says, no, it's not really about that. It's just to get to the water and hear the, hear the lapping and be part of it. This particular water is actually kind of dangerous. There are signs all over that he could not have them take out that say, uh, pregnant women, watch out, children, watch out, nobody should touch it, nobody should eat anything from it. Um, so there's a whole lot of scolding going on around here. Um, you turn the corner, and the, he's got these big boulders that they found on the site, and you walk back in, and they're native plants, they're places to sit, and there's, a, um, there's six different spots where you could have a dock, and you can tie up on these bollards, and again, find a place to sit. Now, the last one is in um, Queens. And it's in Socrates Park, which maybe some of you know about, that was started by Isamo Noguchi and Mark DeSuvero um, in the 60s. DeSuvero is uh, 
maybe a little more famous now because one of his statues was in uh, Zuccotti Park. So when the Occupy Wall Street people were there, the big red statue kind of became part of what people were seeing. But in the background here, you'll, you will see not only a construction crane, but to the right of the crane, some of Mark's work. This is what the park looks like today. It's got um, a lovely spring going on here. This is just about a week ago I was out there. And you can see that there's a guy sitting on the far side of the fence because he jumped the fence. He doesn't want to sit back. And this is a very human tendency to want to get right to the water. And he's actually sitting up sort of high. This is what the um, shoreline looks like around there. You can see that sort of the green scum, that's the rise and fall of the uh, tidal action there. This is uh, looking toward Roosevelt Island. So you're looking straight west. Maybe you'll see the city court building in the background with the diagonal roof. Um, this is very, very typical of New York City's waterfront. Uh, it's, uh, you know, 650 or so miles of riprap that keeps you back if it's not looking so great, it looks like this, falling apart. And if it's looking pretty good, it's actually stabilized riprap with a railing. And you may be allowed to go to it and look out over. But again, don't go too near. So uh, a, a big part of what um, George Trakas is offering is the ability to get into the water. But he's also offering the opportunity, and this is done by the Noguchi Museum and the curators there, to have the artist in a environmental setting that involves the entire community. And these are visioning sessions that four different artists are involved in. And then George chose this project. So there's George at the site. You know, this is very typical. There's a lot of um, cyclone fencing keeping people away. He's got his generator so that he can go down below and put the stuff in. He's almost always on site. If you happen to go before he opens this on May 13th, you'll probably see him there. You get down to the water level, and you see that he's, those pins are now holding some of this, these uh, piers. They're nine columns. And he's calling it Sunyan as a pun on union. But this, this is very typical. So he will, uh, again, you can see the historic remnants of seaworthy craft and piers that are there. That's a big boathouse in the back that isn't used for boats anymore. And um, uh, back to this final shot, simply because I think what this does is show that degraded landscapes can be preserved. They can have an artistic element to them that really allows people to come in. They didn't even know that they wanted to be there. It's surprising everybody. When he asked high school students that came, have you ever been down to this water? They said, no, of course not. You know, we're inside watching TV and doing our video games. So it is actually doing a lot of what we know needs to be done, and it's happening almost despite ourselves. Thank you.